Proton is one of the largest privacy companies in the world with a central suite, including email, VPN, drive storage, and calendar, knocking right on Google's door. In this review, I'll cover privacy and security of Proton, what I love about each service, but also what drives me a little crazy. This will be a longer review given there are numerous services and I've been in this ecosystem since 2017, so lots of experiences to share. I'd argue ProtonMail is the most developed service. Against Gmail, you're getting a quality interface, several advanced features, and good search functionality. Desktop is all web-based, likely similar to how most people use Gmail. iOS and Android have native apps, which I have gripes with, but I'll cover that later. The free plan is generous, the UI is solid, there are attractive privacy and security features, and just to top it off, switching from Gmail is easy to do. Overall, great stuff, but not perfect. First, you have to use their clients, unless A, you're on desktop, and B, you pay Proton to use the bridge, which I don't think should be paywalled. Second, Proton's themes look great, but as someone who switches between light and dark theme automatically, it's silly for Proton to not have a system theme option, especially when their apps have this, opening the discussion on client consistency, which we'll cover later in the video. Another missing feature is templates. Most emails we receive can be responded to with five or so copy-paste templates, and it's weird that such a simple feature isn't there, especially when it's found by one of their competitors, Tutanota. My next complaint is their iPad application, which has no optimization for the iPadOS ecosystem. It's literally just a blown up version of the iOS app. I'd argue it's probably nicer to use the web client on an iPad than the actual app. My final major complaint is how ProtonMail handles multiple accounts on the web. To switch between accounts, you leave the main UI to enter the account switcher, then select a different account, which is wildly inconvenient. All accounts should just be listed in one place, just copy the mobile apps. Despite my complaints, I actually enjoy using ProtonMail. It looks nice, it's functional, and I think it's pretty low sacrifice, all things considered, which is impressive given there's a lot going on behind the scenes to make this a private and secure experience, the extent of which we'll cover later in the video. Now, besides ProtonMail, there's ProtonVPN. In our VPN toolkit, it performs well, offering one of the most trustworthy VPNs on the market from a privacy and security standpoint. Usability-wise, the clients are okay. There's no real custom DNS support for things like NextDNS, and I just generally feel like since they released WireGuard, there's been little evolution. I also never had great speeds with Proton. It's these reasons I probably wouldn't go out of my way to buy Proton VPN. I don't find the user experience better than the other VPNs we suggest, all of which offer similar, if not better, privacy and security with more attractive features, cheaper prices, better speeds, and better clients. The one selling point of Proton is that generous free tier, which is one of the only free VPNs we feel comfortable recommending. So not terrible, but also not great, but it's still nice to have access to this service if you're paying for the Proton ecosystem anyway. Moving to Proton Drive. It delivers on the privacy and security, but the usability is more comparable to an SD card online than an actual cloud provider because First, there's no collaboration or doc editing, which is fine, but compared to Google Drive, that's a huge loss. In Proton's defense though, most cloud providers don't offer this. Second, no desktop clients, meaning you can't directly sync with your local files. Proton said there'd be desktop clients before 2023, but here we are several months into 2023 with nothing. Third, Proton advertises no max file sizes, but after extensive testing, this is not true. Why this happens is because web-based applications have limitations, especially with a zero-knowledge provider like Proton Drive that has to decrypt and encrypt every file, especially on low-power devices, which are a lot more common than people think, and this even varies between browsers. Just to do some quick testing, I uploaded a 1GB, 4GB, and 12GB file, and the 1GB file failed on Safari and Brave on an iPhone 13 mini, and the 12GB download failed on Firefox for Android. So Proton simply can't guarantee no max file sizes, for as long as people still try to use the web, Proton will deal with max file sizes, and the sad thing here is even if Proton releases desktop clients along their mobile ones, this doesn't 100% solve the problem, as what happens if you upload the file via your native app and then send it to a family member who has to download via the web. Their website says Proton Drive has no size limit on shared files. Another one says your recipients can download your file regardless of its size or format using the secure link. No, you can't guarantee that. So stop saying it. Fourth reason why Proton Drive is kind of problematic. 
Proton doesn't integrate Drive with the ecosystem. Why, when I send an email and click attach file, can I not directly attach a Proton Drive file? And why is there no way to just email a file to a contact directly in Proton Drive? It feels like they rushed out Drive without making it a fully featured product to the user. Proton has hinted they plan on making this better, but I have to ask why they released it in the first place when it feels like a beta service. Proton Calendar's next, and similar to Mail, I think it's actually solid. And unlike Drive, Calendar is somewhat integrated into Proton's ecosystem, where if someone emails you an invite to something, you can just directly add it to your calendar. Bravo! My general complaint with the calendar is speed. It can feel slow, though I try to be understanding that this is all zero knowledge and much more complicated to run at fast speeds than what Google does. The apps are nice, though can feel limited and a bit clunky to use, but you know what? If me, the person who plans every minute of their day isn't too upset over this, I have to assume that this is fine as well for the average person, especially since you can share a calendar with external people, not in Proton, and you can even have internal collaboration via shared calendars with other Proton users. So it's not bad, it mostly just works, at least for my needs. To set the scene for privacy and security, what Proton is trying to do is difficult. Email, calendar, and contacts are legacy technologies that were never designed to have modern protections. But despite those limitations, Proton has found good ways to close the gap. First, Proton physically cannot read your emails. They're stored with zero-knowledge encryption. This is even somewhat court-proven in the infamous case where Proton handed over an IP address, which they did state in a 2014 blog post they could be forced to do though their marketing was always a little iffy. It's interesting the privacy community interpreted this as a negative, as Proton proved in an incident they couldn't hand over anything outside an IP address, and pretty much every other private email provider would probably suffer the same problem. The second misunderstood area is end-to-end -end encryption. If you email someone else that uses Proton, you'll have end-to-end -end encryption, end of story, secure email. If the other user doesn't use Proton, you have two options. The first is Proton's password feature, where you send someone a password-protected email, which can even self-destruct, then use a secure communication method to send the password. I use this all the time, as it's super user-friendly. The second option is PGP, which Proton supports beautifully. So addressing concerns that Proton is only end-to-end -end encryption for other Proton users, which is a common misconception, that's just not true. There are three options to use Proton Mail with end-to-end -end encryption, two of which don't require the other user to even use Proton, and they're very clear about this, even labeling in the UI if you're not using end-to-end -end encryption. Third point for privacy and security, while Proton does have mitigations in place to prevent abuse, which sometimes leads to issues, they overall have a private sign-up process, even offering a Tor site you can use to register, which offers a whole new level of privacy when registering for a service. Fourth, aside from Proton knowing little about you and giving you tools to communicate securely, these are a few extra nice-to-haves, like they safely proxy images in your emails. They block trackers in your emails. They offer U2F, though I do wish this was supported in mobile. And they now own a simple login, meaning you gain instant access to a phenomenal aliasing tool to protect your email. And the next point, Proton is open source, which is a huge selling point from a transparency perspective. The status of what is open source at any given moment is another question, which ties into feature parity, which we're about to get into, but I don't think it's disingenuous to say the overall Proton ecosystem is generally open source. So no, Proton is not perfect and they can't guarantee perfect privacy, but they do a great job at offering better protection than almost all email providers on the market, and they're not given enough credit for that. I think people have unrealistic expectations for what an email provider can give them, and Proton has surpassed mine. Now, while privacy and security, I would say, is Proton's strength, let's talk about their weakness. Feature parity. What is feature parity, you ask? It's releasing features consistently across clients so users get a similar experience on every device. Proton released a new, much improved interface in June 2021 for the web clients, but this didn't hit their Android application until January 2022. Then, their iOS app kept the old interface until April 2022, meaning it took Proton 10 months to roll out a new UI across their ecosystem. Proton Calendar was released for web to the public in June 2021, then the Android app was released to the public in April 2022, then the iPad app was released in November, pretty much December 2022, meaning it took Proton about 18 months to roll out their calendar to all users. And these aren't isolated incidents. This is part of their culture. Their CEO stated this directly to me in an AMA. And to speak to this, a month ago, Proton released a new customizable toolbar on iOS with no Android support. 
meaning this is now an exclusive feature for iOS users. A month before that, Proton released scheduled email sending for the web and iOS, once again excluding Android. Are you screaming at me this doesn't matter because these are all not privacy things and it's just usability? Well, Proton did the same thing with their new enhanced tracking protection, only releasing it for web and iOS, excluding Android, meaning in some ways you're actually less safe on the Android app. And even when things seem consistent, they never really are. Proton Calendar seems similar, but Android has a widget and iOS doesn't. That's just a core feature entirely missing from one of two mobile clients. And after recording this, I actually found this amazing Reddit post from someone who actually covers a lot more changes between Proton Calendar for iOS and Proton Calendar for Android. How there's just straight up different views available, the widget, the ability to invite someone, the ability to even create calendars and all these other things here that just literally are not available on the iOS app. Recently, Proton did a poll asking their community if they wanted new document or photo features, and the top comment is neither, just release desktop clients for Proton Drive. People are tired of the inconsistency, which is especially bad when they're advertising this privacy ecosystem and feels like four services doing their own thing. And after scripting this, actually, Proton just released Proton Pass, so a fifth service, which is a password manager, which is in beta with a missing client. In my eyes, there's no excuse, given they have over 400 employees. Yes, 400. People who are coming from the Google suite will notice these problems. And to cover my ass, this is scripted and recorded on April 20th, but given how Proton releases things, many of my points today could be outdated next week. When someone releases a feature, it's expected that it's just going to work on pretty much everyone's devices unless they have a really niche use case. And it feels like not something that I could comfortably recommend to friends and family because they're gonna be like, oh, hey, I just moved my calendar over to this, but I realized this feature was missing on my phone. And it's like, oh yeah, they just haven't done that. Oh, why didn't they do that? I don't know, that's just the way they do things. So I want to like everything about Proton, and there's a lot that I do like, but it's far from perfect. I think ProtonMail and Proton Calendar are their most robust offerings. Proton VPN is fine, but feels neglected, and Proton Drive feels like it should have never been released in its current state. Regarding their integration and the general approach Proton has taken to development, I would expect better from one of the largest companies in the privacy space. Now what Proton knocks out of left field is privacy and security. They're not perfect, but they almost across the board offer some of the most well-built programs in each respective service in the industry. Proton Mail crushes most of the competition from a safety and usability perspective, as does the VPN and Calendar as well. Individually, these services do overall well, but as an ecosystem being compared to something like Google's ecosystem, I'm kind of disappointed. But still, no one's doing what Proton's doing as well as Proton's doing Proton, and that deserves a pat in the back and hopefully the community does a better job of appreciating what Proton brings to the community because what they're doing is truly a challenge. If you're looking to switch to the Proton suite or you wanna buy it or whatever and you enjoyed this review, we have an affiliate link down below that you can use to directly support us and keep us growing and pushing out more reviews and content like this. They take a ton of time to do and we simply can't do them without your support but there's also a standard link down there as well. So there's a choice in the matter there. They're clearly outlined, but we really would appreciate if you use that affiliate link if Proton is a fit for you. Last thing I'll say is Proton did release a password manager and we're probably gonna review it. So make sure you stay subscribed because that should be a good video and hopefully things are good. We'll see what happens there. See you next time on Techlore.